It's my happy task to kick off this uh, book at lunchtime in which we are going to be discussing and, uh, and exploring some of the questions raised by Lyndall Roper's uh, fantastic new book. If I can just hold it up for a moment. Uh, Martin Luther, Renegade and Prophet. Um, just before I hand over to um, Almut Saubam, who will be chairing the session, I just wanted to introduce myself and to say a few words about uh, Torch uh, for those of you who, who haven't yet encountered us. Um, so my name is Elika, Elika Burma, and I'm the director of Torch and also professor of world literature and English over in the English faculty. Launched in 2013, it feels both a very short time ago and quite a long time ago because it's been a very full and a busy time. Launched in May 2013, Torch creates within Oxford Humanities and within the wider university a hub for interdisciplinary discussion, a place where researchers from across the humanities and beyond can come together to, to collaborate. We're particularly excited at the moment because we have been awarded uh, a fantastic um, award by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation in the US to continue this work, to grow this work, in particular in respect of identities, the whole question of identities and of diversity in the academy today. And our funding will allow us to set up um, with your help, with the help of researchers across the humanities, it will allow us to set up workshops, seminars, uh, guest lectures, uh, knowledge exchange projects. It's a whole array and it's really, really exciting. So do have a, a look at our page um, about this new project, this Mellon funded project on the, on the Torch website. So today, very much true to form, uh, we see, an, again, an interdisciplinary array of experts come together to talk about Lyndall Roper's book. We have history, classics, theology, and German represented. So it's high time for me now to hand over to Professor Almut Saubam. She's Associate Professor in German, and her research interests focus on the dialogue between vernacular and Latin culture and on dialogue as a literary form. So I can't think of a more appropriate person to chair. Ahmed, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And welcome to what seems a particularly suitable building for this book and this discussion. It's a very exciting moment. Lyndall Roper is someone who probably doesn't need an introduction, but we ought to do it. She is Regis Professor of History and Fellow of Oriel College, and as she points out, the first woman to hold that Regis chair, and also perhaps the first Australian. She has published widely um, the first books on women and morals in Reformation Augsburg, and a second book on witchcraft, also focusing on archival sources from the south of Germany initially, um, and very much teasing out of the historical material, those things that are not spelt out as events but are there as emotions, anxieties and fears. And in the book that we're going to be discussing today, um, the first of a new wave of biographies of Luther, the first in English to be written by a historian, so a very different take. Um, it's just also appeared in German and will clearly mark the events of 2017 and give us a very different and a new look. And we have a wonderful panel of experts in early modern and psychoanalysis studies, and I'll just briefly introduce them in the order in which they'll speak. Um, Simeon Zahl in the center, um, who is assistant professor of systematic theology at the University of Nottingham, but was previously a JRF at St. John's College just across the road. Um, his focus in research is on how theological challenges are generated by experiences of the Holy Spirit, but today presumably also the Eucharist. Um, and he uh, focuses on the history of Protestantism from the Reformation into modern receptions. Um, and we will hear more perhaps about that, but also the history of emotions and affection and the effective in this particular writer whose psychological makeup Lindell's book explores. Um, then second, 
Josh Elsner, Humphrey Payne Senior Research Fellow at Corpus Christi College and Professor of Late Antique Art here in Oxford, who works on art and religion, the long historiography of religious art, including the European tradition and questions of iconoclasm that became heightened in the Reformation, so he said, um, and he's published recent books on pilgrimage in Greco-Roman and early Christian antiquity with Ian Rutherford, or on Roman eyes, visuality and subjectivity in art and text. And we hope, and I think we're told, that there will be some images <laughs> for his reading and a visual reading. And then thirdly, Laura Marcus, Goldsmith's Professor of English Literature, Professorial Fellow at New College, and previously Regis Professor of Rhetoric and English Literature at the University of Edinburgh. So we'll have two female Regis professors in the room. <laughs> That's probably also not that common. Um, her interests are in 19th and 20th century literature and culture, including life writing um, and modernism. But in recent books, she's also focused on writing about cinema in the modernist period, again, the take on the visual, but also um, the most recent book, Dreams of Modernity, Psychoanalysis, Literature and Cinema, and again, I think, a very appropriate reader for this particular book. So we decided that theology would take the lead, so if I might ask Simeon to give his reading. And then Lyndall will respond to the three readings, and there will be a bit of time for questions from the floor afterwards. Well, it's an enormous pleasure and privilege to have the chance to respond to this fantastic new biography of Martin Luther that Professor Roper has produced. I speak today, as has been mentioned, as a representative of Luther's own academic discipline, that of theology. My own interest in Luther is personal as well as professional. Luther's a major conversation partner in my own research, and for three years I taught a paper on him at this university. But he also played an important role in my biography. Such is the power of Luther's ideas that nearly 450 years after his death, a nine-year-old from South Carolina was made to move to Tübingen, Germany, where he couldn't speak a word of the language. Also that his father could better understand the meaning of Luther's doctrine of justification in the form of a doctorate. I want to begin with a few remarks about Luther's ongoing significance in my own field, where he represents not just an historical figure, but a living tradition of thought. We all know that Luther was important for theology in his day, and perhaps for some time after. To point that out is a bit like pointing out that Julius Caesar was important for the history of Rome. But what has been the fate of his ideas since? And in what ways are they still alive and relevant not just in the churches which bear his name, but in contemporary discourse in the theological academy. The short answer is that he remains massively important, a kind of mountain in whose shadow all Protestant theology in particular continues to live. But the form this has taken in recent decades, to my mind somewhat unfortunately, has largely been of one of attempts to extricate theology from his legacy. In New Testament studies, for example, Probably the most important development of the past 40 years has been a project known as the New Perspective on Paul of trying to read St. Paul for once without the glasses of Luther's powerful interpretation of justification by faith. So here Luther is powerfully present, but mostly as the enemy to be slain, or at least as the yoke to be thrown off. In modern constructive or systematic theology, my own field, we're in the middle of something similar, an attempt to escape Luther's legacy by positing new accounts or recovering very old accounts of how salvation works that don't depend on his legal, transactional idea of justification by faith. And in the field of Christian ethics, and really ethics more broadly, there's been a powerful revival recently of virtue ethics. And this revival is predicated in part and often explicitly on a direct, though I think largely misguided, repudiation of Luther's critique of Aristotle. So the picture from theology is that we are still thinking with and through Luther, trying very hard to pose alternatives to his theology in light of its perceived weaknesses, but finding that effort substantially more difficult than expected. That this is the case is a testament to the absolutely astonishing creative force of his ideas, that their hooks are still so clearly in us 500 years later. 
In this context, as someone who teaches Luther to students of theology today, I am so grateful for this new biography of Luther. The book is, unsurprisingly, it's laudably clear, it's comprehensive, it's readable, almost compulsively readable, at least to a, a Luther nerd like me. <laughs> for this reason alone, it already should be anyone's first port of call in trying to understand the man. More profoundly, however, the brilliance of the book has to do with its approach, an approach that's so well suited to the man himself. In comparison to other biographies of Luther, with one exception that you have in front of you, um, what leaps out to me about Renegade and Prophet is the careful attention Professor Roper pays to Luther's psychological life, especially that as that life was manifested and revealed in the dynamics of his closest personal relationships, their extended reflectionships, reflections on his relationship with his father, with Philip Melanchthon, with Andreas von Karlstadt, and so on. In Professor Roper's hands, this strategy powerfully illuminates Luther's understanding of the real presence in the Eucharist, a key issue for him, the timing of some of his key periods of theological creativity, his visceral reaction and rejection of radical Reformation spiritualities, among many other topics. And this strategy does make a lot of sense. Luther himself was well aware of the powerful and complex relationship between experience and theological insight in his own case, famously stating that, quote, experience alone makes the theologian. And here I think there's something that all of us who strive for creative intellectual breakthroughs can learn from Luther. His case shows, at least in one example, how sheer technical expertise and brilliance on their own are not enough to lead to genuinely innovative research. In Luther's case, as this book shows us, his genius, if I may call it that, was always connected to the way that he had, as it were, skin in the game. The theology of justification by faith, or Luther's incisive critique of scholastic theology, or his haunting theology of the cross, all of these involve not just technical brilliance, but a powerful and complex transmuting of his psychological life, his sufferings, his anger, his experiences, his relationships, into powerful new concepts, concepts that overturned received wisdom time after time. So from Luther, I would say, we, we learn that bra real breakthroughs happen when you have skin in the game. But what about specifics? I think Professor Roper has moved the conversation on Luther forward in quite a number of key ways. Here I'll mention just two. First, and ones that are particularly interesting to, to a theologian like me. First, the book makes a deeply persuasive, sustained argument about the importance of embodiment and physicality, including sexuality, for Luther. Not just as a matter of temperament that he was this sort of jolly, beer-swilling German, but actually also as, as a hard-won consequence of really believing his own theology of justification, which at least in his case freed him to take the body seriously precisely because the body no longer matters very much for salvation. And Professor Roper connects this, again, very helpfully to his enormous stubbornness on the issue of the real presence in the Eucharist. Here we have something fundamental for Luther that has been overlooked and inadequately understood until now. Second, and just as important, uh, is Professor Roper's powerful and complex account of Luther's relationship with his colleague, rival, and ultimately kin through godparenthood, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt. This consequence, uh, this sequence, which proceeds over several chapters, is a tour de force, illuminating this relationship as one of the very most fundamental of Luther's life. To this day, mainstream Protestant anxiety about highly experiential spiritualities, most famously that of Pentecostalism in the contemporary environment, to this day that anxiety is shaped by ideas that came directly out of the, the psychological dynamics of the luther Karlstadt relationship. I could explain that further, but I don't have time. There's much more I could say, but I want to close with a question. Um, I hope it's not too sort of theological a question, though I guess that's my, my role, um, but actually it's one that I think, as Professor Roper will agree, gets very close to the heart of what Luther's about. So in the book, you make a powerful case for the way that Luther's eventual comfort with physicality was a consequence of an ascetic monk discovering that God's favor did not depend upon the mortification of the flesh. And you explain his stubbornness on the issue of real presence in the Eucharist, the issue over which the Protestant Reformation famously split, 
as connected to his rejection of the idea that the Swiss theologians had that we must distinguish between physical and spiritual things. So far, so good. But I still don't quite see why he felt so strongly about the connection between the physical elements of bread and wine and the constellation of faith. He felt that the elements themselves would console. In its initial form, the doctrine of justification is largely about words and relationships. It's about the consolation that comes from trusting God's promise. This is the, the dominant language in the early period of his writing on the subject. But words and relationships are miles away from trusting in physical elements, at least metaphysically speaking. A promise and a piece of bread are such different things. My question then is how psychologically did he hold the two together since he believed that both were such powerful means of consolation? Is it possible that there was a kind of secret, subtle, almost unconscious movement from the words and the concepts more towards the physical over the course of his life? Was he just being bloody-minded? I, I, I still can't get my head quite around it, including it as an historical phenomenon, not just as a theological question. Um, so I hope your book would give me a decisive, permanent answer to this question, which is a critical one for Luther's legacy. I'm afraid it didn't quite, and I'm asking you to help me now. Thank you. <laughs> That requires that we leave that moment of suspense, so we'll move on to Yash Elsner first, and Lindell will solve all questions at the end. Tell me if you can't hear me. <clears throat> now, because I'm in the middle, I thought I should begin at the end. Um, in the last chapter of Lindell's book, um, after, moving, um, uh, after the moving account of Luther's death, she turns to a picture of representations, some, a few, of the ways in which Lutheran culture began to take shape. The discussion takes in the works of Bach and the ways they arise from Luther's own brilliance as a hymn writer and liturgist. It moves to literature in the story of Faust and its climax in the work of Germany's greatest modern writer, Goethe. I speak as a classicist, so Goethe's very modern. Um, and finally, it touches on the painter Dürer, now, Dürer, unlike Cranach, who was one of Luther's closest friends in Wittenberg and uh, knew him well, um, Dürer had never met Luther, but was fundamentally influenced by his Reformation. This swift portrait of the resonance of Luther's work across the great, uh, great artistic representations that would come to form German culture is grounded in the fact that Lindell's hero was profoundly aware of his own self-fashioning through his extraordinary barrage of texts, his willingness to be repeatedly portrayed and hence disseminated visually, especially by Cranach, his grasp of the significance of hymns for the simple folk for whom his message was so powerful. Now this is more than the very self-conscious uh, fabrication that Stephen Greenblatt identified in his famous discussions of the English Renaissance um, in the 1980s because it's also, quite consciously, the grasping of a new culture of fashioning and dissemination, which in some respect uh, must be responsible for Luther's extraordinary success. Now, I'm going to begin again, um, if I can work out how to do this, at a different end. I promised some images. So here you have... Luther at his end. Um, these are a bunch of images of Luther on his deathbed, of which the first one uh, there, on the, the, the first one on the top left, um, is actually reproduced as figure 68 in Lindell's book. So we can say this is the last icon. Um, its frequent replication, as I'm attempting to prove by throwing a few pictures up at you, there's the art historian's typical sleight of hand, its um, frequent replication, as demonstrated by these slides, speaks to this process of cultural fashioning of an image of the reformer bigger than the man himself, heroic, archetypal, mythical. It may be called the appropriation of the sacred icon, the replicated saint, ubiquitous in Catholic spirituality and so rejected by the Protestants, 
um, in the portrayed form of a real man, a hero, a religious superstar, not a saint. Even in death, he is mighty. And in death, his icon is the equivalent of the many portraits made by Cranach over the years before, icons also replicated in painted copies and, crucially, in prints. And so here on the screen you have one of genuine, as it were, painted images and multiply reproduced prints. Um, and this is all what I could find on Wikipedia, I have to con on, on um, uh, Google Images, but of course there are more, many more. Now these do more than spread the image in different media. The relatively expensive one of painting, the relatively cheap, universally available, and easily reprintable uh, product of mass reproduction. They speak to a fundamental transformation in what we may call the media technology of its time that was embraced by Luther to extraordinary success, as is repeatedly demonstrated um, in Lindell's book. Now, we cannot uh, surely separate the Reformation from its leader's willingness to embrace the technologies um, afforded by Gutenberg's movable type, invented around 1440, but widely available to swift use and publication by the time Luther went to war with both Catholic and sacramentarian opponents in the early 16th century. Lindell makes the point that Luther's life, in its most intimate as well as its most public moments, and even in its ending, as is proved by this last portrait, after a drawing from the courts, was lived in the public gaze. In part, he attracted that gaze by going relentlessly to press, often publishing not only his own point of view, but that of the enemy which his text would then demolish. This theological and confessional life lived in public as a constant set of disputes, a battle of apologetics and polemics, was dependent on an instinctive mastery of the new gadget, the new and remarkable mechanism for disseminating both text and image across the entirety of the Christian community without privileging only the elite. Now, we may compare the power of the press in the Lutheran moment, a press that he used to fight the papacy, to fight humanists like Erasmus that he deemed conservative, to fight his evangelical opponents, we may compare this to the ways in which our own in our own modernity, um, gadgets like the cell phone are transforming our means of communication with each other. The dynamics of human interaction in social space, the public way in which personal identities are transformed through such platforms as Facebook or Instagram, the often disturbing model by which likes and dislikes in these media take the form of polemics and apology. I think something of our own uncertainty and insecurity in relation to a fundamental transformation of the private happening around us dynamically as we live, in which people of my generation find it very difficult to grasp the instincts and attitudes of those in my children's generation, something of that is important for us to import back into thinking about the immense changes about subjectivity, in part enabled by the public dissemination of the printing press, and in part shaped especially by Luther's brilliant instincts in using them for spectacular effect. I suspect part of his success was that his opponents simply didn't have the kind of understanding and instinctive mastery at, of how to manipulate these new media, um, what these new media could offer, that were repeatedly demonstrated throughout Luther's career as the reformer par excellence. Now, from the very narrow and particular angle of my own knowledge, I just uh, would like to say something about the significance of Luther and the Lutheran moment for my own academic discipline, the history of art. There is an irony here. Luther was himself not a friend of the smashing of images, although it was his moment of reformation that opened the floodgates of Renaissance iconoclasm across Europe. Just as he was ultimately a conservative about the Eucharist, and I have to say I hadn't grasped before reading Lindell's book that he effectively maintained a Roman Catholic position on the real presence all his life. I'm sure that was a controversial way of putting it. Um, so he was ultimately a conservative about the efficacy and value of the sacred image. But at the same time, he privileged the sacred word of scripture and enabled the word to be understood in an entirely new way by being translated into German. One presumes that culturally it was this act of translation which transformed the German language into so powerful a weapon of literary and scholarly discourse, as well as making scripture available 
to the simple folk. The history of art, I should perhaps call it Kunstgeschichte, is an ultimately German discipline whose every greatest voice until the mid-20th century was written and spoken in German. It is a discipline that has participated in de-sanctifying the image, making it secondary to the interpretative framing offered by words. And it is a discipline entirely dependent on that initial Lutheran thrust that turned the German language into the greatest weapon of scholarship from the 18th to the 20th centuries. With the single exception of Johann Joachim Winkelmann, who was a convert to Catholicism and left Germany for Rome because Rome was more tolerant of homosexuality, in part, every major historian or philosopher of art that wrote in German was a Protestant until Viennese created their school of art history at the end of the 19th century. We may say that the secondary nature of images in art historical discourse, their place as objects of historical, connoisseurial, and cultural discussion, rather than animate, magical, or miraculous agency, is the result of Luther's and the Protestant resistance to such things at the beginning of the 16th century, coupled with their mastery of the technological and discursive models of writing and publication. Of course, the magic of the image does exist and has never gone away. It is just that for the majority of the writing of art history, what we may call its Protestant reflex has made sure that there's no place for this. Now, it would be indecent of me to end on a sour note in relation to this extraordinary figure to whom, um, which uh, Lindell has brought to life in so vivid and deep a way. Her book is a real page turner, replete with psychological insights and with the historical and theological framing that enables us to understand a truly transformative figure in the history of Western culture. Thank you, Lindell. not a Luther nerd, but I did find the book powerful and wonderful, and I'm approaching it as someone in, with an interest in the history of uh, life writing. Um, like I didn't I mention the, the Centre for Life Writing Studies at uh, Wilson College, which is deputy director, and um, so you know, my, my approach to this, this fantastic book is being shaped partly by my thinking about uh, life writing more generally. Um, so, and uh, it, it is an, indeed a, a, a powerful and fascinating study. Um, it comes under the category of, of historical uh, biography, and one of the things I'm thinking about is what kind of biography is Lindell's Martin Luther? What's its relationship to the broader, uh, to the genres of biography and historical biography? And I suppose one question we might ask is, where is the biographer herself in, in the text? This is not a footsteps biography, one of those which dramatizes uh, the role of the biographer, though Lindell does point in her introduction to her decades-long relationship to Luther and Lutheranism, um, both through her father, for a time a Presbyterian minister in Melbourne, and through her graduate studies in Tübingen. So her, her role as historical biographer is both to situate Luther within his place and time, but also through her immersion in and absorption of a vast number of, of his writings, um, including letters, particularly letters, I think, um, private, public, and both, because the private and the public cross over so much, um, to understand him from the to understand him from the inside out. Um, and one of the concepts and motifs that struck me was one we've just heard about briefly was uh, the concept of translation. Um, in the chapter detailing Luther's time in hiding at Wartburg Castle, there's a discussion of his powerful translation of the entire Greek New Testament into a populist German using, quote, the rhythms of everyday speech. And Lindell refers to Luther's approach to his task as translator, the phrase, of course, chiming or echoing with Walter Benjamin's essay on the task of the translator. And she writes in her characteristically lucid and lyrical prose of the rare directness and intimacy with which Luther encountered the New Testament. And the result, she says, was a deeply personal translation that seems to have been written in a single breath. I'd like to have written that sentence. So I see Lindell's role or task in writing this biography as something like that of the translator, um, but less one who brings the Reformation into our own times and terms than one who opens up its difference, its otherness to and for us. 
And this is often a matter of the literal translation of words and concepts. Um, and if it's okay, I will read a, a longish passage, not too long, from the book, because I, I think I want to hear uh, Lyndall's voice here. What had Luther meant, she writes, by this appeal to conscience? It has a modern resonance, suggestive of freedom of thought and of the right of all individuals to decide for themselves. But this was not what Luther meant. The German term he often used, gewissen, is closely connected to words like knowing and certainty. In Latin, the root of conscientia, another word he used regularly, meaning, means with knowing. Luther was, of course, writing long before Freud formulated his three-part model of the mind, where conscience is identified with the superego, the part of the mind which imposes external norms and moral prohibitions. Nor did he mean an inner voice containing the authentic individual. For Luther, the word of God is absolutely clear and plain in its meaning, and conscience is the individual's internal knowledge of that objective meaning of God's word. This is what he meant by his insistent, insistence that his conscience was captive to the word of God. Moreover, for Luther, the conscience is not just an intellectual faculty, but is also strongly linked to a complex palette of emotions. A conscience can be sad, burdened, clouded, joyous, happy, or peaceful. It can be weak or strong or even courageous. It may be paired with the heart, another seat of emotions, and with faith, and it has a special relationship to God with whom it communicates directly. Okay, so I was interested in many things in this passage. One thing here is the invocation of Sigmund Freud. Um, but in, in this passage, in, in fact, it's to say that it would be anachronistic to understand Luther's model of conscience as analogous to Freud's su superego. But nonetheless, this is a biography and work of history strongly engaged with the insights of psychoanalysis. Those psychoanalytic models and concepts are lightly worn in the text, and I'd quite like to ask Lyndall a little bit more about that. In a fuller discussion than perhaps we have time for here, it'd be very interesting to explore its mostly implicit dialogue with Eric Erickson's young man, Luther, um, a study in psychoanalysis and history of, um, which was written in the 1950s and may be the way many people have encountered uh, Luther, a Luther biography in the past. Like Erickson, Lindell is concerned with the ways in which Luther's relationship to his father may have shaped, certainly shaped, his responses to authority, but she is keen not to fix development at a particular point in the life as Erickson does, young man Luther. She writes the life in relation to an evolving, changing identity. So identity is never fixed in the, in the text. And of course, the key term for Erickson um, is identity, but for him, the central construct is the identity crisis. But beyond Oedipus, I think the important impact of psychoanalytic thinking is to be seen most fully in something we've heard about from Simeon, um, the emphasis in the text on the emotions as a force field, as in the passage on conscience I have just read, where we hear about the wonderful phrase, the palette of the emotions. Secondly, the biography is intensely concerned with Luther's relationships, also something Simeon touched on, not just familial relationships, but the contestatory connections um, with significant others, such as Karlstadt and Melanchthon. So this is not a biography told as that of a single, isolate individual. And although Luther's influences seem to be pervasive, he's not always at center stage in the biography. And I like those chapters where in a sense he's off stage, he's up in his castle, but we're still hearing about the world that he is shaping. But it's, it's, a, it's a very subtle way of, of actually placing um, the life within the times. So the, thirdly, um, this is the biography, as we've also been hearing, of an embodied individual, of, man, of a man as body. And this emphasis on physicality is extremely striking throughout. Um, Lindell writes, the transformation of Luther was as much physical and emotional as it was theological. Luther, Lindell writes, sought to derive spiritual certainty from his bodily experiences. That is, he didn't deny or repudiate the needs and desires of the body. And the biography is particularly bold in its engagements with these. 
and with the intense cartology of Luther's writings, I'm much too pretty bourgeois to write about the bodily functions that, that, that Lindell looks at fearlessly. Uh, so the, the body exists at physical, emotional, and theological levels in the text, but its presence also adds something new to the writing of biography, which shares more than an etymology with biology and with life in our broadest understandings of the term. Thank you. Thank you very much. We've heard three very different voices and readings foregrounding the theological concept of the embodiment, focusing on the change of use in media which allows the use of new media in making a private life public in a way that probably sets trends, and focusing thirdly on the voice, um, the shift in the person whom Lindell's biography shades as starting off as Martin Luder of Mansfield, moving briefly to being Martinus Eleutherius from Wittenberg, and then becoming or perhaps even self-fashioning himself as Martin Luther, um, and yet having what uh, Laura had highlighted as a distinctive voice in what he writes. And I hope we now also hear Lindell's voice uh, in a response to her three readers. Well, it's a, a really wonderful thing to have three responses like that. It's just amazing. And it opens whole new areas of thought for me. And I found them all very illuminating and, and helpful. Um, so what I'm going to do is just make a few comments, because I really want to hear what comments you want to, to make. Um, and I'm going to start by coming clean about psychoanalysis. And I love Laura's idea of me being a translator. And I see myself as a two-way translator, at least two-way, so that I see myself as translating Luther, Luther um, and presenting him in a way where he can still speak to us, uh, because I found reading him just so exciting and interesting. And I'm also translating the other way, because there are many ideas that come loosely from psychoanalysis that I'm also trying to translate and engage with in the biography as I wrote it. Um, so I found the idea of being a translator very helpful as a way of thinking about my own intellectual project. And I never enjoyed working on anything so much as I enjoyed working on Luther. I just found it completely engrossing. And it was the first time I felt allowed to write a biography because when I was a student um, doing history, I was always told that biography was not serious and that I shouldn't um, want to write a biography, I should want to write serious history. So it was just a pleasure um, doing this. And I guess um, there were a number of issues that I engaged with in this, in this book. Um, one was, how do you engage with a figure where there is already a pathology about what was wrong with Luther. And that was um, the one that Erickson recounts, but is very widely shared, that, that Luther's problem is that he has a conflicted relationship with his father. And of course, one can see how one can use that to illuminate areas of his uh, theology, but also to trivialize it. So how could I, as a biographer, do justice to the complexity of his relationship with his father, which is clearly very important to understanding who he is, and yet um, not trivialize it and make it reductive. So I also tried to write about his relationship to his mother and his relationship to his siblings, which I think is very important. I think the fact that Luther has sisters is actually one of the reasons why he's not appalled by women's bodies and he is able to develop an anti-ascetic theology. Another of the issues that I had uh, as someone interested in psychoanalysis is how does one think about anality in a way that is also not pathological? Because anality, I think, certainly as it comes in Luther, is connected with creativity and with play. So I wanted to think about that whole question 
and how one can uh, maybe conceive of, of that differently. And I also wanted to think about the psychology of aggression, and I don't think that that's something that I've resolved in this book. I think that Luther's creativity was very closely connected with his aggression. And you can see that in the way that his theology progresses through a series of debates with antagonists. That's what fires him intellectually, that's what moves him on. But also, attacking the Pope, attacking authorities, gives him immense intellectual freedom and allows him to generate new ideas. So I wanted to do justice to that, and yet also do justice to the fact that that aggression can also be very, very destructive. And uh, that I, I found very hard to do to fully develop and understand. And I think it, you can see how that aggressiveness certainly comes out in the way that so many of the friendships end in bitter enmity. This capacity he has for relentless enmity, which I think may be connected uh, to the aggression. Then the other issue that I also wanted to rethink is, as Laura pointed out, physicality, the relationship between flesh and spirit, and indeed, as Simeon pointed out, which I see as, as fundamental to him as a theologian. Just as a, a writer, it is amazing to know what your subject looks like. Uh, that's not a given for the early modern period. You don't know, I, I had no idea what any of the witches I worked on looked like. And this was the first time I had a sense of Luther's body uh, of what he looked like. And of course that's mediated and created. But that was a, a huge feature for me um, in writing about Luther. And of course, friendship was something that I really wanted to explore, Luther's relationships with others. And again, that's in creative tension with psychoanalysis because I wanted to think more about our relations with others, how they work, and how they affect us, not just parental ones, but all the friendships that we have. So I just wanted to respond to Simeon's wonderful question. Uh, I hope I've understood it. I think what Simeon is asking me to reflect on is why is it that the real presence is so central to Luther? And I think he's saying that the book can be read as arguing that it's central to Luther because of the resolution that he arrives at around physicality and sexuality. And I think that he's right in suggesting that that would be reductive and would be a misplacing of the accent. And I'm sure you're right that the book can be read that way. Uh, I think I would say that the reason the real presence is so critical for Luther is because Christ has to be really present in the sacrament because that is the testament and because we have to be sure of salvation. It's the guarantee. And that's also why he insists on hanging on to infant baptism and won't take what looks like the obvious line to take, which is to follow scripture and reject infant baptism. And he won't do that. And I think that's to do with Luther, a characteristic of Luther's faith that I find very appealing, which is that he is in constant struggle. He's not one of those individuals who has a one and for all experience of salvation and its kind of happiness ever after. Luther is someone who suffers from Unfestungen, from temptations, trials, tribulations throughout his life and whose faith is very hard won and is always um, possibly open to doubt. And that I find um, something very appealing. And I think that's why baptism and the Eucharist have to be there as absolute guarantees of faith. And that's why I think they're so important. Um, and then just uh, Yasha's wonderful comment raises so many things. Um, the images here are very, very interesting 
because these are ones that the Cranach workshop didn't control. And they were done at the time, and a local artist and someone called Furtenagel were sent to paint Luther on his deathbed, which itself is fascinating, because there's a whole story here about death and how that changes as a result of the Reformation and how one should die. When Cranach comes to produce the official Luther images, it's not a dead Luther that you get. You get a live Luther, um, but an idealized one. A Luther who's slightly milder, and when you look at that Luther, you kind of know that this is a dead Luther. Uh, it's, a, it's an imagined, um, uh, nostalgic image for the Luther that is lost. Um, so what's really interesting is that you, you don't present an image of the dead Luther as a way of um, proselytizing. It's the live Luther that people want to remember. But there is also a memorial cult around Luther. These images are circulated, they are present. They're not as circulated as the ones of the live Luther, I think. Um, and there's also, at the time, casts taken of his face and hands, which are then in Halle and become a pilgrimage site, a sort of modern, postmodern kind of Lutheran anti-pilgrimage pilgrimage. Um, and I think the whole issue you raise about technology and the link between public and private, how so much of this subjectivity is self-fashioned, I think that's what you're teasing me with, that in fact what looks like subjectivity that I as a historian are um, approaching is, is immensely constructed. Of course it is, but there's no subjectivity without construction. And that doesn't mean that um, uh, psychology is not really important, I think. Um, but that the importance of technology and how Luther expresses himself reminds us of how different the boundary is between public and private. Luther will write in letters about his impotence, for example, towards the end of his life. And he'll write in a letter, I'm suffering from, um, uh, I can't make love to you as I would like, he writes to his wife, and then he writes, and show this letter to Melanchthon, who has the same problem. <laughs> it's just a very different um, understanding of what is private, what is individual and subjective, and, to, and that's in part again to do with the technology of the letter, not a new technology, but one that works exactly like email, because a letter is not private, it's something that you forward. And the whole history of Luther's letters is itself a wonderful, wonderful complex story. And I think the point that Yash makes about the Protestant nature of art history itself is just fabulous. Uh, and that makes me really think, and it's very interesting that you should have ended there, because in thinking about what I might do next, the thing that I really want to do is a double biography of Karnach and Dürer. And I couldn't understand why I wanted to do that, but now I think I do understand. So thank you very much indeed, Yes.